Chanukah Sameach, everyone, for the last time for this year. I hope that the light of Chanukah will extend and spread out to the rest of the world, and there will be just a tremendous amount of light and blessing for the entire year. This week's parasha, Parashat Miketz, we have something unique that we haven't had in a very long time, and that is that we have the start. We, we have a haftar that we read that we usually do not read because the parsha of Miketz almost always falls out on Hanukkah. The last time that it did not was ten years ago, and it's going to be another long time until this happens for us again. And we will be reading about the haftara, the story of probably the most famous judgment in the history of the world, but definitely in. Jewish history, and this is Mishpat Shlomo, when two women come with one baby to King Shlomo and ask him to judge who does the baby belong to. But we also have so much to unpack in this week's Parsha itself, so we're going to focus on that this week. And in this week's Parasha, we cannot start this Parsha without understanding what happened last week, and we can't continue it because it ends on a cliffhanger, which means this Parsha does not stand by itself. You want to read a Parsha that stands by itself, we have a ton of those throughout the Torah. For example, Parashat Noach, the story of Noach, the whole Parsha tells us from the beginning to the end, you can read it, take it out of the rest of the Torah and read that story and you still get so much information. But the story that we're going to hear now about Yosef and his brothers, we read last week that his brothers are jealous of him because Yaakov loves him more than the rest of his siblings and he gives him a special code and what this means and there's so much to discuss and unpack about about all of those stories. And then Yosef goes to check on his brothers. His brothers decide to try to kill him and sell him, and he is sold into slavery. And while he's in slavery, the wife of his master tries to sleep with him. He escapes. He's thrown into prison. While he's in prison, he interprets dreams, and then the, his, the dreams come true, and we are left there with Yosef still in prison. Then... In the end of this week's Parsha, we are left with a crazy cliffhanger, which literally finishes in the middle of a sentence that only next week we will read more about. But in this week's Parsha, Paro has a dream, and in his dream he sees seven cows, seven very thin cows, and seven very large and healthy cows, and the thin cows come and eat the the, the the fat and healthy cows, but they stay very thin. And then he sees wheat that are very, very thin and wheat that are very thick and the thin wheat eat the thick wheat, but they stay very thin and they still don't look good. And he's trying to find an interpreter. And then his cupbearer tells him, says, when I was in jail, there was a Jewish lad, Yosef, and he interpret dreams and what he said came true. And they go and they bring Yosef and Yosef interprets the dreams and explains them. And he becomes a second in command and becomes now the ruler of Egypt with Paro, the second in command to Paro. The brothers now, there's a huge famine around the world. The brothers come to get food. And when they come to get food, Yosef recognizes them, but they don't recognize Yosef as Yosef now looks older. He was 18 when they sold him. Now he's 30 and they're coming down to him. He's 30, 40. Like there's different opinions of, of how old he is when, when they meet, but suddenly he looks different. He's all grown up and he, they, they don't recognize him. So he decides to test them and see how they behave. And he takes Shimon as, as ransom until they bring Binyamin. And there's a lot, a lot, a lot of stories that are happening at that point. But when they come back with, bin, with Binyamin and he sees and he recognizes all of them, then he tells them, here you go, here's Shimon. And he gives them all food to go, to go back. And when he sends them with the food to go back, he puts his golden chalice, a very nice cup that it is worth a lot, and he uses it as if to do wizardry, to be able to know things, to tell the future and know the past, and he puts it in Binyamin's sack. And then as soon as the siblings leave, they chase. The, he sends his guards to chase after and say, go find my golden chalice. And when they go to find it, they find it in Binyamin's sack. 
And he says, Binyamin will be my slave and all of you can go free. And the brothers fall down and say, no, we should, it should not be like this. We should all be slaves and, you know, you set him free. We'll be slaves instead of him. And the question that is important over here is, why is Yosef doing this whole theatric? Why is Yosef going out of his way to do all of this? So as we said, Parashat Miket is not in a vacuum. Parashat Miketz comes as part of the, the book of Bereshit. The book of Bereshit, in many ways, is our story as people, before Jews, just as people. And what we see is that, as people, we have relationships. The first relationships that we hear about are mostly siblings. We hear father and son and, and different types of relationships like that. But for the most part, the book of Bereshit deals with sibling rivalry. The first siblings in the entire Torah, Cain and Hevel. Cain kills Hevel over what? Over nothing. We're not even sure what it is because it just says, and when Cain and Hevel are in the yard together, and Cain says to Hevel, and Cain pick, kills Hevel, right? Like there is no, there is no even context of why Cain kills Hevel. It's just the sibling rivalry. Then we have the stories of the the brother, the the children of Noah, and one ends up becoming enslaved to the other to the others by misbehaving. We have the story of Abraham's kids. Yitzchak and Ishmael, and all of the, the trouble that that brings. Yaakov and Esav, twins, that who can be more like each other but twins, that come out polar opposites, and we hear that Yaakov needs to escape Esav because Esav says, I want to kill Yaakov. And Yaakov has 12 sons, and as they see and know, each generation, only one continues, and Yaakov is grooming and picking Yosef. So what do they decide to do? To get rid of him. Yosef is now in Egypt, knowing that his brothers wanted him dead and wanted to kill him. And Yosef comes and basically wants to see, is there a future for there being 12 tribes? Are they united once again, and we can all be siblings? And start the nation over there, or are the next is the next generation the children of Yosef, Ephraim and Menashe, who we see have a wonderful relationship? Are they going to be the first siblings without a rivalry? Which is why Yaakov blesses them, and they are blessed together. And when we bless our children on Friday night, we say, "Yesimcha Elohim keEphraim vechim Nashe." You guys should be like Ephraim and Menashe. We don't bless, may you be like Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, or like the 12 tribes, but rather, may you be like Ephraim and Menashe, that they do not, they, they're not fighting each other for the position of power like the other siblings were. But Yosef wants to see, have, have the brothers changed their, their mind? Will they, will they now behave each other? Will they act like brothers? Because when Yosef comes to his brothers and is crying to them to save his life. They throw him in a pit. They take his coat, this famous coat. They drench it in blood and bring it to Yaakov and say he's dead. And when Yosef sees that the brothers are willing to be imprisoned or die for Binyamin, he knows that the, there's a hope for the siblings. There's a hope for the brothers. There is a way to be the 12 tribes of Israel. It is extremely important to realize that we are 12 tribes, that we have different ways in our behavior, in our actions, in our belief system, in every single aspect. So much so that when we leave Egypt and it says that God split the sea of reeds for us, it says there's two different options. One is that it is split into two and the whole nation goes in together. But one of the commentaries says God splits the ocean into 12. So each tribe walks out in its own section because we are one nation with 12 different ways of doing things. And that 
does not mean we're not united. And that's a very, very important thing to know, especially in these days, especially with everything that was going on before the 7th of October, before Simchat Torah and the tragedy that happened, is we need to remember that united does not necessarily mean that we agree, but that we know how to work together, that we know that we are sacrificing for each other because Anashim Achim Anachnu. We are all brothers. Shabbat Shalom. Chanukah Sameach.